Chapter 7 Wherein the cavalry officer receives a promotion to the rank of lieutenant. You feel the heat from the Duke of Canaris' banefire longsword on your neck as its razor sharp edge hovers, o hovers a thumb's width from your exposed throat. You meet your regimental colonel's steady gaze as best you can, ac acutely aware of the fact that three more swords are also pointed at you from each side and back, each just a step away from putting 20 centimeters of steel through your throat. Cunaris speaks. You hang on to every word. And do you, James Dahl Castleton, swear to always uphold the king's laws in your service, to maintain the security of the realm and to follow, without compunction, the orders of His Majesty the King and those he has placed as your superiors. You hesitate for a moment, but only for a moment. You faced far deadlier things than a sword in your face. You steel yourself and quickly regain your composure. I swear by the saints and by my sacred honor. Canaris does not miss a step. Do you, James Dahl Castleton, swear to protect the person and interests of His Majesty the King upon the field of battle? Do you swear to discharge this most vital duty so long as you have eyes to see, legs to stand upon, and an arm to fight with? The answer comes more easily this time. I swear by the saints and my sacred honor. Do you, James Dahl Castleton, swear to live a life clean in both mind and deed, and to serve as an example to those who are bound to follow you, I swear by the saints and my sacred honor. Cunaris gives a small knowing smile and withdraws his sword. All around you, you can hear his aides doing the same. Then by the authority of his majesty, King Miguel I of House Rindauer, I hereby appoint you lieutenant in the service of his majesty's Royal Dragoon Regiment. Saints, guard the king. You exit the large stone building, serving as the Duke of Canaris' command headquarters, feeling no different than you had before. When you were in training, you could not help but look enviously at the lieutenants, at the two shining pips upon their collars, and at the rooms they got all to themselves instead of having to share. However, now that you have spent some time in service and have earned that fateful rank yourself, you realize that all your lieutenancy means is a more ornamented uniform, a larger room, and more responsibilities. Worse yet, you have not been given consideration for a command. After all, leading a patrol is work for a cornet or an NCO, not a lieutenant. You had to leave your old unit behind when you left Major Hunter's outpost for Naringa two weeks ago. Well, isn't that a shame? Not. Some of the men spoke their farewells with genuine affection, although you had no doubt that some others were cheering your departure in the silence of their own minds. You spent the afternoon and evening being fitted for a new uniform, bearing the silver tower and two gold pips of a lieutenant on horse, off horse. Unlike enlisted men who must make do with the often ill-fitting issues of assigned uniforms, as an officer you are expected to pay for a un new uniform as part of the cost of your commission. As such, your new, new tunic and trousers have been made to fit you by a tailor residing in Noringia specifically for that purpose. After a few hours of fitting and alterations, your new uniform is complete. To your pleasure, it fits you perfectly. It is now past sunset, and you are most exhausted. You remember the way back to the officer's billets well enough now, and the intervening time and the substantial garrison have considerably improved the conditions at night in Noringe. As you cross town in the darkening gloom, your thoughts turn quickly to your new promotion. You now float in an uncomfortable limbo. For you are too senior to command a patrol and still too junior to be given command of a troop currently led by a more experienced officer. Your only hope is to be given a newly formed unit or to replace an officer killed in action. Honestly, you have no idea what your next posting will be. The entire future of your career is up in the air, relying entirely on the whim of his grace, the Duke of Canaris, and of course the boffins at Grenadier Square. How do you feel about that? Hmm... Requesting a promotion was a mistake. I would much prefer to be back at the outpost with my men. No, we've seen how that turns out. Uh, yeah, I'm confident. Perhaps your opinion will be vindicated in the days to come. Then again, perhaps not. Only the moon and stars remain in the sky by the time you get to your quarters. Stopping a moment to allow the sentries at the door to verify your identity, you are led to your room by an enlisted man stationed just for that purpose. You warily strip off your old cornet's uniform and place your new neatly folded lieutenant's jacket and trousers in your wardrobe. 
Soon you will, be, you will be moved to a larger room, more befitting your improved station in His Majesty's army. For now, you are perfectly content to fall into your bed and drift silently into sleep. The next day, you dress in your new uniform. Hearts in your throat, you report to regimental headquarters for new duties. Unfortunately, no new field commands are available. Your new assignment is to the Duke of Canaris' staff. Normally that would mean that you would be required to help maintain the administrative duties of the regiment, to shuffle reports and bring the most important requests to his grace himself for his consideration. In reality, with squadron and troop commanders handling their own paperwork, your new post effectively sets you at liberty. Over the next week, you quickly learn that, save for a requisite check-in every morning, your actual duties basically involve sitting at your cramped desk and watching your regimental commander read Kian philosophy and write letters to his family. Your posting seemed little more than an excuse for His Majesty's army to keep you on hand until real work comes up. None of the other desks seem occupied save for maybe a few in the early, very early morning. On the sixth day, the Duke finally takes you aside. Lieutenant Castleton, I assure you there is no need at all for you to waste away your youth waiting on me. Canaris' expression is a mix of pity and bemusement like what you would expect of a kindly uncle. Go on, I set you at liberty. I'm sure there is something else you would rather be doing. With your entire day freed up by your regimental commander's orders, you suddenly find yourself with more free time than you have ever had since you joined the army. Without a unit to maintain or the immediate threat of combat to demand constant readiness in mind or equipment, you stand at a crossroads regarding how to spend your days. A few options present themselves. First, there is the officers' club, which has remained exactly as it was on your, on your first visit to Norangia. With a garrison of some 1,200 men, the town offers enough fellow officers to provide tolerable company. Most use the time to gamble away their pay at the constant games of Tassensword. Some extra funds could be won on the side if your skills are good enough. Yeah, we we already know our skills in gambling aren't any good. In addition, you learn of a rather crude but well-maintained training grounds outside the town's wall pro at the town walls proper, which the garrison uses to maintain drill discipline and train up new arrivals. While you no longer have a unit to train with, your own skills could always use improvements. There is also genuine advantage in remaining at your post in a regimental office. With little other company, you could ingratiate yourself with your regimental colonel. After all, the Duke of Canaris is a wealthy and vastly influential man. He, or those who might come to you to petition him, might prove most useful acquaintances in the future. Lastly, you could deal with the fact that you still have very little comprehension of the language of those who you are fighting against, for a small fee, you could hire some local to teach you the rudiments of the entire tongue, which might prove useful in future. Is it just going to say again, he's going to teach you, but I'm just too stupid to learn anything? Maybe. Mm. I still think, like, that's what I thought right at the beginning, that that would be the most useful thing. So, again, we're going to attempt to learn it. As it turns out, a handful of crowns is more than enough to entice a well-educated and thoroughly bilingual former merchant captain to teach you the basics of the language. You arrange bi-weekly meetings with a tutor. The entire language is a difficult one to learn. The intonations, grammatical rules, even the alphabet are alien to anyone who has grown up speaking Terran. Regardless, over the course of the next year, you are able to begin grasping the basic concepts of the language. Within a few months, you are able to comprehend, more or less, the conversations of the townsmen who have remained in Naringe. By the time of the first snowfall, you are stringing together sentences. When spring finally arrives, you have begun learning how to write as well. <laughs> yep, this all seems in line with my intellect. Start. <laughs> that seems like very, very slow progress. <laughs> Considering you have two, two lessons a week. I don't know how long these lessons are. But I'd assume, like, we've, I mean, we've got more than enough free time. What, what am I doing other than those lessons anyway i've basically now set up two may let's let's just say two full days we've still got five other days where we could be doing stuff like improving our soldiery but apparently not no okay uh yeah two meetings a week for about 30 weeks i would say L begin learning to write okay little more than a year after your promotion, you report to the Duke only to be informed of some rather interesting news. I'm afraid, the Duke says, that I shall not be seeing too much more of you in the future. His face is a mask of some slight regret, but no sadness. 
The Duke, the Duke explains that thanks to the Royal Dragoon Regiment's distinguished service, including, as the Duke is non reluctant to mention, your own, Grenadier Squa Square has decided to increase each squadron's size from fi five to six troops each. This, of course, means that your squadron now has an open field command position. As the senior officer without a command currently serving under Captain Montez, the honor will naturally be yours. You are to have your own command again. Nice. It is the work of a few minutes to confirm your new assign assignment with the cloaks and notaries. You are given receipts and told to collect the equipment required for the command of 40 men and horses. A great stack heap of schedules, regulations and drill books are placed in your arms. You are told that the first of your men are not to arrive from Tierra for another two weeks. You have until then to ready yourself. Finally, the Duke offers his own parting gift. I am sure that you would not wish to take command of a, an entire unit of strangers. Thus, I have spoken with Major Hunter and reassigned your old patrol from the outpost over the River Karan. Oh no. <laughs> they will form the nucleus of your new command and they should arrive within the next three days. Sure enough, one evening, two days later, Fenton, now wearing the free crown chevrons of a staff sergeant, presents himself before you in your quarters. With your men following close behind, as such you formally recognise them as the first members of 6th Troop, 3rd Squadron, Royal Dragoon Regiment. With all this done, Fenton gives you a firm handshake and a slight smirk. Here we are, all together again. Fine thing, isn't it? You can't quite tell if he's being sarcastic or not. Some desultory conversation breaks out, but the men, obviously uncomfortable inside an officer's room, take the leave after a few minutes. Two weeks later, a ship arrives with the first dozen of your men. They are likely the worst soldiers you have ever seen. The first inspection proves that however much appreciation Grenadier Square might show for your efforts, it is not enough to send you proper soldiers. You find their carbons to be in abhorrent condition, their sabers rust-spotted, their uniforms slovenly, and their ability to follow even the most rudimentary drill sequences to be all but non-existent. Worst of all, when you receive their files, you know that the majority of them carry a stamped C next to the names. Your new men are, for the most part, conscripts, usually criminals given the choice of the king's dam or the gallows. Great. When you tell your regimental commander of your situation, Cunaris is sympathetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sympathetic. Mm -hmm. He's sympathetic, but far from surprised. I'm afraid you'll get no better recruits for the rest of your men. He warns you over a glass of Cantori whiskey. When war broke out, all the best men like yourself volunteered. The financiers were thrown into panic by old King Edmund's death. They began hoarding their coin instead of spending it, and those who counted on their customs suffered for it. That meant a great host of honest, hard-working folk took up the king's arms to feed their families. Now those good men are dead or already in service. We've not but the women and the children and the dregs of society left, and even the best of that scum is being skimmed off by the admiralty. I'm afraid this is all we've got left, my boy. The duke puts a great bear-like hand on your shoulder, his eyes meeting yours in a steady gaze. A warming, lad. These rats won't dare... A warning, not a warming. <laughs> These rats won't dare raise a hand against you and Naringia, not with a thousand armed honest men around them. But the second you lose sight of the walls, they may turn on you. I'm keeping your troop in reserve until an emergency arises. Use that time to make sure that your men will not disgrace the king's colours when they are finally put to the touch. Canaris swirls around his glass for a moment. Perhaps he thinks his words have been too harsh. You've a good look of men from your last command. Use them. A good lot of men, Jesus. With that last piece of advice given, the two of you down your drinks. His grace dismisses you with a simple, good luck. It takes another month for the rest of your men to arrive, and another week on top of that to get them mounted and properly billeted. With Captain Montes and the rest of your squadron on detached duty with the Duke of Wolfram's army, you effectively have free reign to put your new command into fighting trim. Which is a fine thing, as drastic measures are quite obviously needed. All of your men are as bad as the first batch. Discipline is deplorable, the men's weapons and sadly are in a frightful state, and perhaps worst of all, they all seem to resent you as nothing more than a lordling like the ones back home. You doubt that any would follow your orders under pressure. You know full well that the first thing you must do is appoint new corporals and sergeants to command the individual six-man patrols which constitute your unit. While Staff Sergeant Fenton will return to his previous post as your senior non-com, the other slots must be filled. How do you appoint your new non-coms? Mm. Uh, 
This is an interesting one as well. I know the men from my old patrol are not the best soldiers. And they're probably not the most intimidating. I think picking the most dangerous looking and biggest men might be the smartest choice here. Because picking those who seem the most literate and bold... Ah, actually, I'm, I'm torn between these two. This is just a no-go. Because it, there's too much uncertainty here. If I pick the most popular men, then they're sure they're... Um, it, what's the opposite to superiors? Does inferiors work in this context? I don't think it does. Their subordinates uh, will certainly follow them. But that also means that they will definitely follow them over me. And should those most popular men decide to uh, desert me, well, let's just say it's probably not going to look good for me. Picking those who seem most literate and well-spoken has pretty much the same problem as picking the men from my own patrol. They're probably not the most intimidating and the like it's it's going to be difficult for them to keep their subordinates under control i would assume depending on how literate and well spoken they are but picking the biggest and most dangerous looking men mm, you know what we're going with most literate and well spoken that way at least i can properly relay my orders to them um, and hope that this goes well you select those who seem the best educated, which means you have effectively filled your non-commissioned ranks with conmen and other such rogues capable of varying a veneer of civility. Quickly realizing that their well-being rests entirely on your whim, they begin winning the men over to your side with silver tongues and copious amounts of drink. While their methods increase the men's loyalty, their relatively lax control causes discipline to suffer. Ooh, minus 13%. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay. With the non-coms appointed, you can finally set to the work of tuning, uh, turning your unit of thieves, rogues, gutter rats and beggars into a proper fighting force. As it stands, the men are unordered, dispirited and don't resent you overly much. What do you work on first? Hmm. hmm. Yeah, they do need, they do need discipline. <laughs> I, I can't deny that. You run your new men through the drill manuals, slowly at first to make sure they have the rudiments of the King's Manual of Arms, then faster and faster until they are able to load, present, fire, reload, dismount, mount and perform a handful of other common actions without even thinking. After a few months of constant practice and improvement, you think they might even turn out to be proper soldiers. Unfortunately, the constant drill does not overly endear you to the men you are running ragged. Being berated by sergeants and ordered around by an officer from dawn until sunset with time for little else does not do the men's spirits much good. Okay, morale is garbage. Also not particularly good. Months pass and the falling leaves and cold rains herald the beginning of the cold season. Like the rest of the enlisted men held in the town, your dragoons are to be moved to winter quarters inside the city walls. As maintained and paid for by the army, as a courtesy, you are allowed to inspect them beforehand. They are, in a phrase, the worst lodgings you have ever seen. The floorboards are rotting, the thin and lumpy beds are packed with insects, termites infest the timbers, there is no chimney and the only windows open downwind of an exposed latrine pit. You have no doubt that should your men be forced to lodge here, they will be far from pleased. You decide that... Mm. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm just gonna... <sighs> can intercede on my man's behalf and find some better quarters for them. Okay, we'll try that first. I hope if it fails, we still get the options of those two and then I'll pay for it myself. You go to the quartermaster's office to attempt to find better quarters for your men. Unfortunately, it seems that every other officer with a substantial command in Noringa is doing the same. After waiting for the better part of a day, you reach the clerk at the desk. Sadly, you are neither senior enough nor prominent enough in the garrison to get better quarters for your men. The troop takes the news hard, but thankfully do not take it out on you as they seem to understand that you have tried your best to get them better quarters. The men suffer through the winter in their wretched lodgings. Uh, morale and discipline suffer. I wanted to pay for it. Come on, give me that option. As the new year begins, Nuringia begins to buzz with more than the normal crop of political conjecture and personal gossip. 
rumour begins to spread that some hot-headed Antari lordling is gathering an army to throw the king's forces into the sea. Not only that, but it is said that his army would be bigger than any previously faced, and that the north has been stripped bare of fighting men to fill its ranks. Even more excitingly, it is said that the Duke of Wolfram is gathering a substantial number of the king's regiments to not only throw back the impending Antari offensive, but to do so in a way as to end the war by the autumn harvest. One summer day, as you approach the entrance to the Duke of Canaris's office to hand in your weekly report, you see another man stumble out of the door. He wears the grey, green and red of your regiment and the free gold pips of a captain on his shoulder. He seems in a fearful state. Aside from his conspicuously new tunic, his uniform is splattered with the dust of hard riding and what appears to be dried blood. As you approach the officer to greet him, you recognize him with a start. He's none other than Elson. His face is newly lined, scarred and covered with summer dust, but the features are unmistakable. Taller, slimmer and more confident since last you saw him four years ago. You see the light of recognition flare in his eyes as he sees you. Captain Elson's Elson approaches, his hand extended in greeting. Ah, oh, Castleton, I see you've made something of yourself in the past few years. You take his hand and the two of you shake politely, your expression civil but not overly friendly. Tell me, fellow, are you and your men in the mood for some blade work? Certainly. You ask for details. Elson gladly obliges. We ran into some Atari two days back, maybe three or four hundred of them. A big group. We threw everything we had at them and fought back, but they bloodied us just as well as we chastised them. I've just gotten permission to call out the reserve, that's you by the way, to reinforce the squadron so I can go back north and finish the poor fellows off while they're still reeling. You look up at your friend with confusion. Shouldn't Captain Montes be leading the squadron? Elson answers with a sad shake of his head. Montes is dead, he breathes. An Atari lance got him in the chest when we closed into a melee. His expression turns gentle for a moment. It was quick, a good death. He says, his voice barely a whisper. As the lieutenant with most seniority, I was called to replace him. His grace just gave my commission a minute ago. Third Squadron is my command now. Elson turns to you, his expression serious. So, fellow, I shall finally have a chance to fight alongside the complete soldier himself. Do you think you and your men are up to it? You do a quick assessment of the men under your command. Ultimately, you can conclude that your troop is poorly ordered, poorly motivated, and very loyal. You meet Elson's gaze and reply. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> They're a right awful mess. Uh, they could stand... Uh, <laughs> they could stand a fair bit of work. I can offer no guarantees. Elson's face goes blank as he assumes a sceptical hard face that you doubt the guileless boy soldier of four years ago could have even attempted. They'll have to do, Castleton. I was hoping for better, but we take what the saints will give us. The newly minted captain runs his thin pianist's fingers through his hair as he looks pensively northwards. He breathes for a moment, just in and out, slowly. Then he turns back to you, his eyes intent. I've brought my troop here so that we may draw from replacements and bring them back to strength but I've left another troop at the rendezvous point. Get your men together and tell them the news. I'll get my men a meal and some saints be damned sleep myself too, I suppose. Assemble here an hour before sunset. The rally point is half a week northwards on the old highway. I'll lead you there myself. Then we can set ourselves to the real work. 